National Archives and lying to investigators. I might say it seems Sandy walked out of the National Archives with some PBDs in his BVDs and some classified docs in his socks. I was surprised and astonished uh, when I learned that he had taken documents out of the National Archives, stuffed them in his socks. Uh, I have written that the only reason Berger might have done this was at the behest of Bill Clinton or someone of similar stature who wanted information or, you know, single copies of unique copies removed from the archives. The papers reportedly revealed Clinton's response regarding the Millennium bomb plot and Sudan's offer to turn over bin Laden in 1996. But because Sandy Berger destroyed these critical secret documents, the American people may never know the truth about these events or the Clinton administration and 9-11. The documents that he stole pertain specifically to the sequence in the miniseries that they were upset about. I believe they are criminally guilty of distorting history. There was a smoking gun in there in terms of what the Clinton administration knew about bin Laden. Sandy Berger had a mission. That mission was to go in and clean up history, clean up mistakes, destroy any evidence of uh, error uh, or culpability to uh, actions that led to 9-11. He accomplished that. He b basically paved the way for her to move forward and give Bill a free pass. I mean, it's that simple. Sandy Berger was fined, lost his security clearance for three years, and was disgraced, especially in Washington. But he has resurfaced. Reportedly, Berger is now an advisor to the presidential campaign of Hillary Rodham Clinton. It's either that he's really good at foreign policy, which I doubt, or he knows something, <laughs> or they owe him. And I think that's what it is. Do I think uh, he should be advising Hillary Clinton? I think he's a perfect candidate to advise Hillary Clinton. He's sleazy, he broke the law, he will do her bidding. Uh, he should be her chief of staff, as a matter of fact. Hillary is tough on terror as long as it's popular. But once again, the real Hillary Clinton remains a mystery. We went through all the speeches that were posted on her website, some 200 of them. and. There's no speech that's about counterterrorism or talks about the threat to the homeland. Whatever Mrs. Clinton took away from the 9-11 experience is now slipping away. Or perhaps she never meant it in the first place. But as far as I know, Senator Clinton simply has not wanted to discuss with clarity and certainly with uh, the kind of authority you would expect from a now senior member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, that we are at war with a totalitarian ideology. I'd like to see a president in either party uh, who is going to be honest about the nature of the danger and willing to stand up and say, this is what needs to be done, even if it's not popular at the moment. She doesn't seem to have any instinct to be able to do that, whatever her high intelligence might be. Who is the real Hillary Clinton? Clinton scholars and writers hoping for an answer were shocked to learn that, despite Freedom of Information Act stipulations, after three years, the Clinton Library has only released one half of one percent of its records. This is the mentality of a tyranny, and yet the media treats this as if it's no big deal. It is a very, very big deal. We paid for those documents at that library. Much of our money goes into that library. It's a federally run operation. The Clinton Library is known locally as Little Rock's Fort Knox. Nearly two million pages of records covering Hillary's years in the White House are locked away, clouding her role in policymaking. Over 300 Freedom of Information Act requests are pending. Well, that's not my decision to make, and I don't believe that any president or first lady ever has, but certainly we'll move as quickly as our circumstances and the processes of the National Archives permits. This idea they're claiming now that, that um, oh, we're, we're trying to release them, we're trying to as fast as we can, but, but the library just won't let us release them. If you want the papers released, order the papers released. They're your papers. A tendency of this administration from the top all the way to the bottom, is to withhold information, to resist legitimate requests for information, to 
refuse to be forthcoming about information that is of significance and relevant to the job that all of you do and the interests of the American people. I think the American people have a right to as much of the public record as possible about Hillary Clinton. Those records should be released before the 2008 election so we can learn a lot more about exactly how much influence she had in the White House, what her positions were in the White House, and how she acted in the White House. Character is defined as what we do when we think no one is looking. By that standard, many critics say the Clintons are sorely lacking. On January 20, 2001, President Clinton issued 140 pardons on his last day in office. Those pardoned or receiving commuted sentences included cocaine trafficker Carlos Vignali and the biggest tax fugitive in U.S. history, Mark Rich. As much as those pardons reveal about Bill, an earlier pardon may have revealed even more about Hillary's character and her willingness to do anything to get elected. I remember the first Met game my dad took me to, and we were sitting at the very top of Shea Stadium. It was probably 1971. It was just a beautiful day out with, with my dad. You know, he loved the Mets. He loved his sports. That's one thing that I'll never forget, is sort of being in the car with him and being at the game with him, just enjoying his presence. It was an idyllic childhood, to be honest with you. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better childhood up until I was nine. My dad was a very decent, honest family man. As a matter of fact, on that day, January 24th, he was looking forward to coming home that Friday, celebrating my brother's 11th and my 9th birthdays. It was going to be a big family event for us. Francis Tavern has an extraordinary place in American history. It's where the Sons of Liberty met. It's where George Washington bid farewell to his officers at the end of the Revolutionary War. And it's also the place where Frank Connor, my father, was murdered in 1975. On January 24th, 1975, I was working as surveillance on the west side of Manhattan, and the sirens started to go off. Just an endless stream of fire trucks, police vehicles going down to the southern end of Manhattan. Short time later, turning on a radio, easy to find out that there had been a bombing at Francis Tavern. Nobody dreamt that this was a daytime bombing of a restaurant in New York City in the United States of America because it simply was not the sort of thing that happened in America. The senseless bombing had been perpetrated by what was arguably the most active terrorist organization in U.S. history, the FALN. But in 1975, the FALN was a newly formed, previously unheard of organization that through deadly violence advocated complete independence for Puerto Rico. I kept hoping and thinking that maybe he's under rubble trying to get through and there's a mistake. It really didn't happen, that he was okay. My mom says now that all she wanted to do was run. She wanted to run out the door and keep running. I remember I was a little tiny nine-year-old and there was one of the guys that picked me up and I was sort of punching him in the back, not knowing what, how to react to something like that. Joe, this is the Bissell dining room at Francis Tavern. And this is the room that suffered most of the damage in the bombing on January 24, 1975. The bomb was placed actually just on the opposite side of these doors. Waiters and some of the other witnesses remember seeing somebody come through this door carrying a large duffel bag. Uh, he looked around the room. One of the waiters was about to approach him and tell him to, that he had to leave when he stepped back out apparently left the bomb outside. This was a typical FALN device. It was a quantity of dynamite, right. included propane tanks, which was one of their trademarks in building their bombs in the early days, and a simple timer, a wristwatch, altered to serve as a timer to set off the device. So he knew when he placed it that essentially the people that he was that he had seen were going to feel the impact on Absolutely. He knew that he was committing mass mur murder, no question about it. Where, where would my dad have been sitting in relation to this table? I believe your dad was sitting at the end of the table here, Joe, uh, and would have been one of the first people hit by the blast of the bomb.
Joe, the bomb being just outside this door here, when it functioned, much of the blast came, of course, through into this room, knocking down this door, and that shock wave would have taken everything in the room and just made missiles out of it. So you have victims that have pieces of glassware, pieces of silverware pushed into their bodies as a result of the blast. Rick, do, do we know why they chose the time, the place, the day? The communique that they left said that they were trying to kill capitalist, imperialist pigs in Francis Tavern, and specifically cites Francis as being the target. Four died, and more than 50 were injured. It was a typical FALN operation, one of over 130 bombings between 1974 and 1983. But on that crisp winter day at Francis Tavern, no one could imagine what the future held for the murderous members of the FALN. Hillary's biggest problem running for the Senate was that she wasn't a New Yorker. And how is she going to appeal to the specific ethnic groups that make up the New York State electorate? So in September 1999, right in the middle of her Senate campaign, she was approached by city councilman Jose Rivera, who really is a spokesman for the Hispanic community in New York, who gave her a packet urging the pardoning of the FALN terrorists. And included in the packet was a letter to Hillary asking her to use her influence on her husband to get these pardons granted. And two days later, they were. Freedom came today for most of the 14 Puerto Ricans who accepted President Clinton's controversial gift of clemency. 11 of them, who describe themselves as nationalists, some others describe them as terrorists, were released from federal prisons around the country. It made no sense. Not one of the incarcerated FALN terrorists had requested clemency or had expressed any remorse. In fact, prior to that action, the Clinton administration had granted clemency in just three cases out of over 3,000 applications, according to the Office of the Pardon Attorney at the Justice Department. It was putting a political agenda of the Clintons above my father's life. Sandy Berger appeared on television a day or two after the pardons were granted, or after the clemency was granted, and stated that these people were not personally involved in violence. That's simply not the fact. In this case, these people were convicted of planting 36 bombs in Chicago. If that's nonviolence, then Mr. Berger's dictionary is a little bit different than mine is. The Department of Justice uh, received a memo from the FBI saying that under no circumstances should these people be released. The President of the United States, who had access to all this information, ignored the facts of the matter. You have to ask yourself, who benefited from this besides the terrorists themselves? It's my view that have concluded the only other person that could have benefited from this was Hillary Clinton. The Senate, on a 95 to 2 vote, later denounced President Clinton's FALN clemency. Candidate Clinton claims she is the most experienced. Her husband claimed she was intimately involved in his administration. And yet, Hillary said publicly she had, quote, no involvement in or prior knowledge of the decision. Obviously, she knew about it. Obviously, she asked Bill to do the pardons, and obviously, when she says she knows nothing about it, she's not telling the truth. How dare they? Um, my father was a decent, honest um, family man, and he was being forgotten or used as a, as a political pawn by those people who didn't have his decency, didn't have his family values, and wasn't the kind of man that my father was. We've had only two father-son presidencies in the history of our nation. We may be on the verge of the first husband and wife commander-in-chiefs. Historically, Americans have never been keen on dynasties. So it's worth remembering that a vote for Hillary is a vote to continue 20 years of a Bush or a Clinton in the White House. American people deserve to know that their presidency is not for sale, the Lincoln bedroom is not for rent, and lobbyist money can no longer influence policy in the House or the Senate. The problem with nostalgia is what we tend to do is you only remember what you like. 
and you write, and you forget the parts that you didn't like. So what John Edwards is saying uh, about outmoded thinking and nostalgia is really, I think, expressing um, a reluctance to turn American democracy, which is very, I think, meritocratic, over to two families. And Hillary Clinton would represent the past in that and a continuation of, I think, a dangerous trend to electing people because of uh, how much recognition they have rather than their intrinsic qualities. Finally, before America decides on our next president, voters should need no reminders of what's at stake, the well-being and prosperity of our nation. We uncovered a radio show that Eleanor Roosevelt, her heroine, did in 1934. Eleanor Roosevelt was asked during the show, when will a woman become president? Her answer, when a majority of the American people have trust and confidence in the integrity of her. And that's the challenge that Hillary faces. It's been said, and I agree with it, that this is the most personal political choice that Americans make. We're very interested in their personality traits, their person that they could trust, that they would like. That's where I think Hillary Clinton as a candidate has great defects. She's not accountable. She'll never be accountable personally for anything that she does. And her personality is such that she believes that the end justifies the means no matter what uh, those means are. If she weren't married to Bill Clinton, what is there that she has accomplished in her life that would lead you to believe that she should become the most powerful person in the country. Which candidate is most likely to be able to be successful in protecting us from the threat from radical Islam? That is the central crisis of our time. If she reverts to form, Hillary Clinton will likely be in the future what she has been in the past, which is a person, a woman, a politician of the left. And I don't think that's going to be good for the security of the United States. She can't favor English as the official language of government, has said she can't favor it. Eighty-five percent of the American people favor English as the official language of government. I think there are a number of big issues where you'd have a very clear contrast. She favors liberal judges. 91% of the American people favor the right to say one nation under God. The bigger this campaign is, the bigger the choice is, the more trouble she's in. What will be important though, and this is some baggage she has to deal with, is the idea of a co-presidency, the idea that Bill Clinton will be back in the White House. Because I think when he left the White House, people had had enough. I can't imagine that Americans want to go back to, to the 90s and the country being dragged into this, this ugly, dysfunctional family drama. I certainly don't see Hillary Clinton as someone who can unify the country. Uh, President Bush didn't. I don't think she would either. I think that we're at a very critical time in this country uh, that requires leadership. And uh, I can tell you, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that uh, Hillary Clinton, I know, is not equipped, not qualified to be our commander in chief. This vote comes down to one thing, liberty. Do you believe in liberty or don't you? Economic liberty, free speech, protecting our borders, uh, protecting our country from terrorism. The issue is liberty. You know, on January 20th, 2009, someone will stand on the steps of the Capitol and raise his or her hand to take the oath of office. as the 44th President of the United States of America. We must never underestimate this woman. We must never understate her chances of winning. We mustn't be lulled into a state of security and complacency by the newfound moderation that she likes to talk about. And we must never forget the fundamental danger that this woman poses to every value that we hold dear. 
You see, I know her. <laughs> 